next to the fallout from the division of Europe which followed the Second World War. As Winston Churchill put it in a speech from 1946, an iron curtain descended across the continent from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic. The consequence was that those on the west of that iron curtain after 1949 were generally under American implied protection as part of NATO. Those on the east came under the strict influence of Moscow and not always willingly. For example, 60 years ago, students and workers took to the streets of Budapest to protest at Soviet rule in Hungary. The demonstrations turned violent, and for a while the revolutionaries were in control. In 2010, Ed Butler spoke to one of the rebels, Peter Palai, who was a first-year student at university when he joined in the street protests in Budapest in October 1956. All we wanted was that we should have a more humane treatment, we should have a more livable society, that socialism should actually live up to its name. So we were going to march. And a lot of people spontaneously started joining from the sidewalks. People looked out of office windows, some of them hung out the Hungarian flags, and workers started pouring into the centre and joining us. So what started out with a few hundred students, soon turned into a fantastic mass demonstration. It's very hard to estimate how many people poured out onto the streets, probably half a million. People started shouting various slogans, and one that sticks in my mind, which the first time it sounded a bit risky, but we all took it up, It went, probably the best English translation, that soldiers of all lands go back to your homelands. And as the evening wore out, somebody (laughs) started shouting, Ruskies go home, which is Russians go home. And I had absolutely no premonition of the fighting to come. At that moment... A couple of people came on motorcycles, terribly agitated manner. They were shouting, screaming that the security police is shooting at unarmed people at the radio station. And we ran into the street where the radio building was. And we actually came under fire, and it was a terrible shock. Next to me, a 14-year-old girl was just cut down by bullets, and I was very lucky not to be shot. I saw absolutely no weapons on our side from anyone. Suddenly people had the idea that there was a large barracks building on that same boulevard to go there and get the army people to give their weapons. The crowd broke down the door, and as the doors broke down, we saw a line of soldiers with bayonets fixed and a lieutenant in command, and the lieutenant started shouting at us that he will order the soldiers to fire if we proceed any further. Even if we wanted to back down, we couldn't because of the pressure of the people behind us. We started shouting at the soldiers that you're not going to shoot at your own kind, are you? And the soldiers didn't. They just pushed this officer aside and we suddenly streamed into this building. So we were given ammunition and armed with rifles and ammunition. At the radio building, the battle was fantastic, but by that time our side was armed. It had turned out that workers came from another suburb, from an industrial suburb, and they broke into factories where not just ammunition but weapons were made, and they armed the rebels, and they were armed themselves, and they were storming the radio. After just five days of popular revolt, the Soviet troops stationed in the capital pulled out. A reformist communist, Emre Naj, was installed as the country's new president, pledging the end to Moscow's control. For a few days, it seemed as though the revolution had won. And for Peter Palai, a dream had been realised. I mean, we went from a demonstration where no one thought there would be any fighting, then it turned into a terrible struggle which ended, or seemed to have ended, with a miracle. And we thought that finally this little country which was squeezed between Germany and Russia and the Turks and all the great powers, finally, finally, we can determine our own fate. What happened then? And we, we, on the 3rd of November, which was a Saturday, we heard news that a Hungarian delegation made up of party people, all parties, and of Hungarian rebel forces went to talk to the Russians how they shall be withdrawing and how the 
Hungarian rebel forces will not fire on Russian troops. And I remember that, very relieved, I went home to sleep to my parents. I took my weapons with me. And next morning I woke up and heard gunfire. And we switched on the radio and we heard the Premier Imre Nagy saying that the Soviet troops had attacked unexpectedly and he was asking for help from the West. This is the Hungarian Prime Minister Imre Nagy speaking. At dawn, Soviet troops attacked our country in order to overthrow the legitimate Hungarian democratic government. On the streets of Budapest, civilian fighters armed with nothing more than rifles tried to stand up to the might of the Soviet tanks and artillery. It was an uneven contest, and Hungary's cries for help became increasingly desperate. This is Hungary calling. This is Hungary calling. The last remaining station. We are requesting you to send us immediate aid in the form of parachute troops over the Trans-Danubian provinces. For the sake of God and freedom, help Hungary. They had overwhelming strength. I did realize that it is all lost and I didn't want to go back to fighting because I knew that it would be just senseless to lay down my life. It was terrible. We couldn't quite believe that the world will just sit back and do nothing about this. So what happened to you once the Soviets regained control of the city? Well, my friends and myself, we were manufacturing various leaflets which we stuck up in various parts of the town. And when I was walking home, my dad was waiting for me on the corner. And dad said to me, don't come home because they've been looking for you. Dad handed me a briefcase. In that briefcase was a bottle of plum brandy, my pyjamas, a toothbrush, 5,000 foreigns. And he said, mother sends his love, go, don't come back. He said that we go northwest. And there's a huge barracks building used to be manned by the Hungarian border guard, now filled by Russians, which is practically straddling the border. He said there's a regular searchlight going around. It's predictable how it's circling. And we should try to go as near as we dare to the Russian sentry because there's a north wind that evening. And if we approach them from the south, their voices will be carried to us. But we have to crawl. I don't know how long it took. I was scared out of my wits. There were three of us. And we crawled for God knows how long. And when we left the Russian voices behind, we stood up and started walking. And I did something very melodramatic, something which I must have read in books, but it came from the heart. On the last piece of Hungarian ground, I just knelt down and kissed the land, kissed the ground, because I thought that I'll never see my parents again, I'll never see my friends again, I'll never see my country again. And that was to be the fact for 28 years, actually. It was a feeling of broken hopes, it was a feeling of betrayal, it was a feeling of there's no justice in the world, the pointlessness of politics, the pointlessness of doing anything, and the Russians can do anything they want to us. Peter Palai was among some 200,000 Hungarians who fled the country. He moved to London, becoming a journalist, and worked at the BBC World Service. Thousands of others died in the fighting, or they were executed in the crackdown that followed. Among them, Imre Nagy, the president. It was to be another 33 years before Soviet-backed communist rule was finally ended in Hungary.